gang violence is is up again. Um, that interracial gang violence is at an all-time high. Um, and so I want to get back to this feeling of accomplishment that you had, which was genuine, because for a while there was change. For a while there was change. Now, besides the education programs, what kinds of social programs, talked a little bit about justice, what kinds of social programs did you see as important objectives for the Brown Berets and what ones, what programs did you engage in that were successful, that you personally felt were successful? Can we talk a little bit about those? Because you came out of the schools, you had made your, your educational statement, okay? What next? Well, we, we made some demands and some of those demands were met. Uh, one of the demands is that we wanted more uh, LASA teachers and uh, we want more Mexican-American teachers and we got that. Uh, we asked that we have more uh, uh, administration and counselors, uh, Chicanos, and we got that. Uh, we asked that the curriculum change, and we got that for a while, then they took it away. They did change the curriculum. We had more Chicano studies classes in the high schools, but they took them all away. And now we're back to back to zero, back to the 50% dropout rate, because it's, it's, it's systematic discrimination, systematic uh, denial of our students, systematic uh, uh, pushing our students out of school, and, and uh, the, stu the students don't have no say-so. And so we're saying something's wrong with the system that pushes all the students out, screens all the students out. Uh, for example, the, uh, the high school exit exam, the math and geometry requirement, we're just screening our students out, and so that's why the, the dropout rate is so high. Ralph, do you have something to add to that? Ralph? I think we lost him. Yeah, but anyway, uh, from yeah. 40 years ago until now, the education really hasn't improved. Our condition still remains basically the same, if not worse. Uh, if you're a brown parade, you can't attend school or they'll suspend you. And they find you if you miss going to school. And we're going to be having a protest on the 12th of September uh, for the uh, immigration reform. And they are already threatening the students. If they walk out of the school, they're going to kick them out. Well, once we get past, I mean, we can't really get past the education issue. I mean, that's current, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a future. But there were other social programs that the Brown Berets engaged in to take action in the community. And some of them were very pioneering and very significant at the time. Um, Louis, do you want to talk about any of those? I remember when I was growing up in the Brown Berets, and I still remember, the violence, the gang violence, it, it went down a lot. We had members that were gang members at the time in the Brown Berets. Mm -hmm. And they brought the violence down a lot. There was not hardly any fighting or killings or nothing. We're back at that stage again, so we have to go out there and, and redo it again. Well, so one of the things that, one of the social programs that uh, not just in Los Angeles, but in many other cities and states that the Brown Berets uh, started were free clinics. Uh, uh, there, there, there's a tremendous need now, as and there was a tremendous need then for poor people to get medical treatment when they needed it. Uh, it, it needed to become available um, uh, as, as as the people needed it, and th th there was no place where they could go if they didn't have money or if they didn't have insurance or insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the Brambury Brem started free clinics in uh, many cities, in many states. And one of the other points to that was that um, there was absolute privacy when people went to the Brown Beret Free Clinic and if they had a drug problem, if they had an alcohol problem, if they had these kinds of problems that might affect their jobs and, and their, their livelihood, when they went to the clinic they could get help and it wasn't 
and it, it wasn't, um, you know, their names didn't go on anybody's right. ledger. So that was very, very important. Um, the other thing, now, of course, we've, we've got some serious health problems. Do any of you have any idea about what proportion of the Chicano population or Hispanic population is lacking medical insurance today and lacking any kind of um, you know, financial basis for seeing a doctor, for getting drug treatment, well, for on, getting their children vaccinated. We're on the very, very bottom of, uh, of all the population. I can't remember what uh, the statistics on this is, but we are the lowest on the totem pole. And there's really nobody doing anything about it. They blame the illegal immigrants for not paying for the hospitals. Yet if you go to any of the hospitals, you don't see as many Mexicans as you see other nationalities getting the treatment. And then especially the illegals with all this uh, deportation that's going on, they're afraid to even come out of their house. Now they're going to stop anybody that's Mexican in the streets and ask them their status, see if they're citizens of the United States. Well, and what that means is that there's, again, a, um, a, a, a class totally under the table. Mm -hmm. it's, not, under it's, not, the, it's, not even, it's not even the working class. They used to call us the bottom working class. We're not even the working class. Half of our community is unemployed. We're the unaccepted class. And nobody's helping the unaccepted class because they're not accepted. And that's one of the reasons why we have so much violence and so many kids going to jail and so many kids going to prison. Um, tell me something. I, I'm going to switch the conversation just a little bit because what I'm interested in knowing is what difference in your life did the experience of Brown Berets make for you? And where did your life lead you that you hadn't really envisioned, you know, 40 years ago? What did you see yourself? becoming 40 years ago? What did you see yourself becoming well, when I 30 joined, years ago? When I joined, I didn't know nothing about the Brown Berets. That was in 1968. Mm -hmm. Walking down Soto Street, I seen David Sanchez, Ralph Ramirez, and some other Berets out there and asked what the organization was. I didn't know about myself at the time. I joined, went to some demonstrations, I liked it. And they taught me a lot about a lot of things in society, in life, in my rasa. David taught me a whole lot through my years that I've, that I've been in a brace. And I'll always be a brave person in my life. But it helped me a lot to understand a lot of things. Well, some of the original Brown Berets moved on to college. And you were one of them, David. Um, Ralph was one of them. Carlos was one of them. Richard Diaz was another one, and moved on from there to, um, some people moved on to uh, jobs in the private sector, and actually rose quite high in, in corporate structure and corporate ladders. But the majority of people who were founders of the Brown Berets have moved into and continued with social action projects. And given much of your lives to um, social change, really. Um, and that inspiration came out of the experience that you got in, in the barrios. Um, you know, so many young Chicanos of that period took advantage of the Civil Rights Act of 1967 to get to college. Others took advantage of it to get teaching jobs in colleges and universities. Um, still others took advantage of it to go into um, corporate work and so on. So that right now you will see um, Chicano names on um, the board of directors of many different kinds of corporations. But some of you stayed with the business, if you will, 
of social change and targeted populations for social change. I, I'd really like to know from all of you in this conversation, what inspired you to the direction? What kept you at it? I mean, David, you've been at it for 40 years. What keeps well, you at it? I think I think it's just uh, once you do it so long, you do it automatically. You don't think about it. You just do it. It's faith. Yeah. It's the, faith. The, other, the other thing is, is we have developed. We're committed. Uh, uh, we have developed a, a, a science, a, a nonviolent movement science that nobody understands but us because we've been there. We learned how to apply nonviolence in a strategic way. Uh, we learned how to uh, have impact by pickets, demonstrations, marches, uh, occupations such as on Catalina Island, uh, caravans, uh, expeditions. We learned how to do things. Uh, and becoming the tool, we learn how to apply the tool of social change so well that, that we continue to do it. In a non-violent way. But this takes enormous personal commitment. Yes, it does a lot. I'm still with it and I'm going to continue with the rest of my life until the day I die. I, mean, I, I was talking with Joe Rosso, who wasn't exactly a Brown Beret, but he was you know, kind of in the leadership and, and, and worked on La Rosa newspaper and La Rosa organization. And Joe was a very dedicated, committed man, and he's still dedicated and committed. But one of the things he said is that he traded, and it wasn't necessarily uh, a good trade for him, he traded his family life for the cause. And sometimes now he regrets that. But then he said, that if you're going to be dedicated to a cause, that is what you're married to. That is your family. And I've heard something like that. I've heard something like that from David. Ralph, are you there? Would you like to add to that? What I just said about about Joe Rosso's comment that that by being dedicated to the cause he was not able to do the dedication to a family that he feels, you know, was neglected instead. Well, that, that conflict always, um, always comes up in the, in the life of an activist. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there never, inevitably becomes a conflict between uh, the, the, uh, the person's activism and the other aspects of their life. And you've experienced that. Oh, yes, I think everybody has. It, it, it would be impossible. Uh, that the only way somebody could, could not experience that is if they're, like, they're born wealthy or something like that. David, how do you feel about it? You, you've practically, well, as far as I can see, you've, you've dedicated yourself so much to the cause that you haven't even begun to start a family. Well, for, for me, a family would be very expensive and very costly and very time consuming. <laughs> and uh, I like the road, I like to travel a lot. And being in the Brown Berets gives me a chance to travel to the different chapters of different towns. Uh, but also, I think, you know, once you become a dedicated person uh, to the cause, uh, you don't think too much about yourself. You, you, your, your community becomes the first person uh, in your life and you become the second person. Uh, but also I think it's, you know, you get so involved in, in actions over the years that you don't, you, don't think about, you don't think about it, you just do it. It's like, you know, a student that doesn't do his homework because he thinks about not doing it. No, you don't think about not doing it, you just do it. That sounds like a great sound bite. <laughs> I, I really like that. <laughs> it's like me, I'm married, mm -hmm. and my wife understands what I do and I explain to her. I'll be committed to the rest of my life as a brown beret. And I'm going to continue that. She understands that very well. Yeah, one thing, uh, I feel that being a brown beret, you've been doing this all your life, and it's kind of hard to walk away from people that need the assistance, and nobody gives it to us. We're, uh, we see things, we uh, participate in a lot of different events, and 